Hello there, my name is Nick Dale from Nick Dale Photography and what I'd like to do is to give you a brief outline of the rules of composition. Now I'm a wildlife photographer so most of my examples will be of animals and birds but the rules are equally applicable to other types of photography so portrait and landscape, street, whatever you like. Okay, so let's get going with the most common one, one you've probably heard of before, the rule of thirds. So this is a rule that is based on the fact that the human eye doesn't really like subjects bang in the middle. Unless they're symmetrical, unless it's a reflection or something, what we prefer is something that's slightly off to one side, either to the left or to the right or slightly above or slightly below centre. So the way we can think about that is in if we uh, draw two lines horizontally and two lines vertically, at equal intervals over the frame and then we can think about those lines and those points of intersection. So if we have a subject that's long and thin like a giraffe we can maybe put it on the left hand vertical line or the right hand vertical line. If we have a subject that's um, a little bit more rounded or compact then we can put it at one of the points of intersection. So this moth for example uh, or butterfly is close to being on the upper right point of intersection. So in other words, where the top line um, meets the right hand line. Okay. The most important thing you can do when you're taking a picture of an animal is to focus on the eyes. The eyes are the windows to the soul, as they say, and it works in wildlife photography too. So usually when you're focusing, you've got different focusing modes on your DSLR or whatever camera you have, but the best one to use is single point focus. And what you have to do is manually place that point or that little square over the eye of the animal. Now, given the rule of thirds, you might want to put that on the right hand side or on the left hand side at the points of intersection and you might want to change it from one to the other as the animal maybe changes direction if it's walking from left to right and then right to left or something but all you need to worry about is that the eyes are in focus again because of a quirk of the human eye we tend to think that the whole image is sharp when the eyes are sharp so it's like a shortcut if you have a picture where the whole image is sharp apart from the eyes strangely enough, we'll think it's blurry because the eyes are so important. That's what we instantly tend to look for. So when you're focusing on the eyes, make sure your camera is set up correctly. Make sure you've gained focus before you shoot and then you can take as many as you like. Okay. Photographers are often told to tell a story in their pictures. I personally think the use of story is a little bit far-fetched when it comes to photographs. You know, I realise that a picture tells a thousand words, but um, it doesn't have a plot, it doesn't have a beginning, middle and end, it doesn't really have characters, so I think it's maybe a metaphor too far. However, there are certain pictures which portray a scene or a situation that you can instantly recognise. This is a picture of an elephant um, chasing a few lines away from a tree. I remember this happening, this was in uh, Chobe, uh, on the Chobe River in Botswana, and we say that the lion is the king of the jungle, but actually, when it comes down to it, the matriarch of an elephant herd has far more power. And this particular one came along, saw the lions in the way of her herd, and she simply chased them away. So this picture tells a story because it's immediately clear what's going on. The elephant is stamping her feet and trumpeting and the lions are simply running for their lives. Now, one other thing that um, is crucial in wildlife photography, and I guess in most other kinds, is the idea of the decisive moment. So this was a phrase coined by Henri Cartier-Bresson, who was French, funnily enough, and <clears throat> he even wrote a book on the subject. So what he thought was that 
if you take a picture slightly too late or slightly too early, then you end up with a product that's just not quite as good, an image that doesn't quite work. So this picture of an elephant is one I took from a boat on the Chobe River in Botswana a few years ago, and it illustrates my point. So we saw the elephant coming along the riverbank, and I knew that it was going to come pretty close to us, so I asked my driver just to beach the boat um, close by, and we waited. When the elephant came past, spontaneously it decided to give it a dust bath. So I ended up uh, taking a sequence of pictures on continuous, maybe about 15 or 20, as it went past. Now, there were some half-decent shots amongst those 20 pictures, but this was the moment that counts. Yes, this was the decisive moment when most of the dust exploded on the back of the elephant and we could see all the energy and the movement and you know that dynamic feeling that I was looking for. When it comes to framing, I'm not talking about... Uh, negative space is another idea that people often talk about. So um, what does that mean? It's essentially just space. I don't know why they call it negative space, but the idea is that you can balance a frame by having a subject on one side and then space on the other. Now, the idea of balance is not in terms of weight, if you like, or mass. It's just in terms of you know, aesthetic balance, visual balance. If we see this picture, for instance, then the focus of the image, in every sense, is the eye of this Grevy zebra. But on the left-hand side, there is negative space. Now, the image is balanced, even though the subject is just on the right-hand side, because of that space on the left. So this is a concept which is quite useful if you want to take a portrait. What we don't want is to end up with passport-style portraits, whether it's of people or of animals. So what we can do is we can take uh, our subject and put it either on the left or the right of a landscape frame rather than a portrait frame, leaving negative space on the other side. And that will enable the image to look balanced. Again, it's just one of those quirks of the human eye. We just like balanced images, but the way in which we create balance seems a bit unbalanced, strangely enough. Anyway, it works. Leading lines are another way to lead the eyes of the viewer towards the subject. The subject is the most important part of the frame, particularly in wildlife photography, because we don't really care about the background. Yes, it may add atmosphere, or it may show the animal in its environment, like an environmental portrait, but essentially the reason why we look at wildlife photographs is because we love wildlife. We want to see, in this case, the giant Galapagos tortoise, we're not particularly interested in the trees. Trees we can see anywhere. Galapagos giant tortoises, we can't see everywhere. So what are leading lines? Essentially, they're any strong lines in the image that lead towards the subject. So in this case, and this is a classic example, it's the dirt track. The dirt track is going towards the horizon at the top of the frame, so it leads the eye from the foreground to the background, but then, ah, there's the tortoise. So it's done its job, yes? So when we look at leading lines, usually they tend to be diagonal, so they tend to come in from the corners of the image or from the sides, but they don't have to be, okay? What they do need to do is to lead the eyes towards the subject which is what's happening here. Now, symmetry is an exception, as I mentioned earlier, to the usual rule of thirds. So we don't want necessarily um, to put all our images bang in the middle, but if they happen to be largely symmetrical, then we do. So a classic example might be um, the reflection of something in the water. In that case, we can put the horizon right in the middle, centrally, horizontally, 
so that um, it looks balanced. But you can also do the same vertically, as in this case, with a juvenile rufescent tiger heron, just in case you were wondering. So in this case, it's not quite symmetrical. The foreground is a little bit messy, the logs and the leaves and so on, and the bird's head is obviously pointed to the right. But the way it's holding its wings and neck is symmetrical. So that's why I chose to centre the subject. Now, it's often said that the most important rule in wildlife photography is your point of view. So we want to enter the world of the animals. So in order to do that, what we have to try and do is to get down to eye level. Now, obviously, that depends on which animal you're talking about. If it's an elephant, it's a lot easier than if it's um, a lion, as in this case, lying down on the savannah. Fortunately, in this case, this was in Botswana, it was on a little bit of a mound, so because I was uh, on lower ground, I was able to get to eye level. But as I say, the point is that you want to enter their world. If you take a picture looking down on an animal, it makes the animal look small, and therefore often unimportant. If you take a picture of an animal looking up, then it'll look much bigger. Now that can have a role, that can be appropriate, if, for example, you want to make a, a large animal like an elephant look more imposing, more powerful, more massive. But generally, the rule is that we want to stick to eye level. Silhouettes are a trick that um, can be very useful in wildlife photography, but it's often difficult to find the right location to create the shot. So ideally, uh, what you want is a west-facing slope that leads up towards the sunset. Now, this particular picture was taken in the Masai Mara, and we managed to find a slope like that um, at around 6 o'clock, which was just before sunset, and then we were able to get out of the jeep, lie down, and take pictures of the animals. So in this case, this is a blue wildebeest, and it just happens to be overlapping the setting sun. Now silhouettes um, are one way of taking advantage of something called backlighting. There are two ways of lighting your subject in wildlife photography, or two main ways. One is to have the light behind you, and one is to have the light the other side of the subject. Now side lighting can work as well, but those are the main two options. But if it's going to be backlighting, and one of the ways you can take advantage of that is to create silhouettes. But make sure that you have a strong shape for your subject. So, for example, if you're taking a picture of uh, an animal, you want a silhouette that's easily recognisable. Now, some animals are just more recognisable in silhouette than others. So, for instance, with this wildebeest, you can recognise the horns, whereas with some of the cats, they don't have such strong silhouettes. And generally, it would be better with the cats, for example, to have a silhouette in profile, because then it would be easier to recognise the animal. So you just have to uh, find the right subject first, and then obviously put yourself in the right position. One thing to remember when you're doing silhouette shots is that you want the sky to be roughly in focus. So that does mean probably using a narrow aperture, something like f11 or f16. If the sky is too blurred, then you don't get the benefit of a gorgeous sunset. So you want the animal to be in focus, obviously, nice and sharp, but you also want the clouds to be in focus. Now, when it comes to the exposure, you don't actually need to do too much. The camera will be faced by a frame that is largely bright. It'll be the bright sky with an even brighter sun, so it will deliberately underexpose because it'll try to find this 18% tonal value that the manufacturers plug into cameras. Now the world is not 18% grey. In particular cases, it may be on average, but in this case it's not. So the camera tries to find that 18% value by underexposing the sky. And that's fine, because that's what you want. You want the animal to be in silhouette, and you want the foreground to be black, essentially. 
You don't need details in the ground. What you want is detail in the sky and the clouds. So that's fine. Separation uh, is one of the most important um, principles in wildlife photography because you don't want your photographs to look messy. We don't want overlap between two subjects. So in this case, this was taken in the Maasai Mara in Kenya, and it was very, very exciting. It was my very first kill that I'd ever seen, and the cheetah was chasing this Thompson's gazelle almost directly towards our jeep. However, the important thing is that the gazelle and the cheetah are separate. Yes? If you imagine the same picture, but with perhaps the cheetah's tail cutting across the head of the gazelle, then it wouldn't work quite as well. So when we look at wildlife shots, what we're often doing is looking for overlap. Obviously, sometimes it's inevitable. You can't make sure that the animal's legs don't overlap, for instance, but that's why we use continuous or burst mode. We want to find that ideal situation, if we can, even if it means you have to rely on a little bit of luck. Okay? But generally, when we're composing, we want separation. Now, obviously, in a fast-changing environment like a cheetah kill, you only have seconds between the beginning and end. So it's panic, left, right and centre. You don't know what you're doing. It all happens very quickly. So the readiness is all, as Shakespeare would have said. You have to be prepared, you have to have the right settings, you have to be in a position where you don't need to worry about your shutter speed or your aperture or your focus mode, whatever it is. You can simply focus on composing your shot and taking as many pictures as you can. As I say, the action happens very quickly, so you might have to rely on a little bit of luck, but the more pictures you take, the more chances you'll have of getting the perfect shot. Motion blur is something that happens when the animal or parts of the animal are moving. Now, it's not necessarily bad. It depends what kind of effect you want. The higher the shutter speed, the less motion blur you'll have. But it also depends on how fast the animal is moving, on what angle it takes across the frame, and also, of course, how fast the legs or the wings of the animal or bird are moving. In this case, this is uh, a migrant hawker dragonfly, and you can tell that the wings are going to be traveling pretty quickly. So I used a shutter speed of around a 500th of a second, but you can still see the motion blur on the wings. Now, what's the advantage of this? Well, it means it gives you that sense of energy, of dynamism, of movement. If the wings had been absolutely frozen in time, then it might have been a decent shot, but you wouldn't have got that sense of movement. So it's up to you to find that sweet spot. We obviously don't want the whole subject to be blurred. We want the important bits to be uh, sharp. So traditionally, the head and the eye have to be as sharp as possible. But we also want the wings, perhaps, or the legs to be blurred and that gives that sense of energy that we're looking for. In addition, if we're doing a slow pan, then we can actually get the background to be blurred, which helps in separating the subject from the background. And if you're panning across, if you're turning at the hips, then you'll actually get some streaks in the background, which at very slow shutter speeds can look very attractive. Depth of field is something that's important in wildlife photography because you want to isolate the subject. So the human eye generally tends to look for things that are bright or sharp or big or colourful. And when it comes to colour, we prefer warm colours to cool colours. So when we're trying to make the viewer look at the subject rather than the rest of the frame, then we have to bear those things in mind. And one of the ways in which we can prioritize the subject is to make the subject sharp and the background blurred. Now, it's a combination of factors that affect that. One is the length of your lens. 
So longer lenses tend to produce more background blur, known as bokeh. The aperture also affects it. The wider the aperture, the more the blur in the background. So the less depth of field you have. But also it's a function of the ratio of the distance from yourself to the subject and the distance from the subject to the background. Now in this shot of a cobra taken in Delhi in India, I wanted to focus on the cobra, obviously, not on the man, not on the snake charmer. So what did I do? I focused on the eyes of the cobra and I used a very wide aperture, a 5.6 I think, and that meant that the background was pretty blurred. Now I had to get pretty close to the snake, but unfortunately the guy's hand was also very close, so I couldn't use the ratio of the distances at all. I could use a long lens, so I think I took this with a 300mm focal length lens, so I was using two tricks out of three, if you like. Now, depth of field is important in this shot for one particular reason, and that's the uh, wristband that the guy is wearing. Now, normally, as I say, we'd be attracted to bright and colourful things. So the wristband or the bangle is bright and it is colourful and it does have warm colours. So that would normally be a nightmare. If I'd chosen F16, then the wristband would have been perfectly sharp and the viewer's eye would constantly have been flicking between the wristband and the snake, not knowing where to go. But the fact that it's blurred sends a message to the viewer that it's not important. Yes, it might be bright. Yes, it might be colourful but it's not particularly big and it's certainly not sharp. So that way we can focus on what is sharp, which is the eyes of the snake. Notice that I focused on the eyes and not the nose or the very front of the snake. You can see that the front of the snake's head is actually just a little bit soft, but that doesn't matter. As long as we have the eyes sharp, then we've done our job. And of course the rest of the snake is also blurred, but again, that doesn't matter. What we want to do is to focus on the eyes. Again, another strange thing about the human eye is that we tend to like odd numbers of subjects. Obviously, a lot of photographs are taken of one subject, so that's an odd number if you want to be pernickety. But generally, if we're taking shots of a group of animals or a group of subjects, then it's better to have an odd number. So hence, these three king penguins work because there are three of them, not two, not four, not six. Equal if you're taking a still life shot, let's say, of some oranges or apples, make sure it's an odd number. I don't know why, I can't explain it, it's just one of those quirks of the human eye. Fill the frame is one of those exhortations that you're often given as a photographer. So these days everyone has a camera because we all have a phone, but it's very difficult to fill the frame with a smartphone because it doesn't really have a very long focal length lens. It'll just be a few millimeters. So when it comes to wildlife, particularly in Africa, for example, you tend to be quite a way away from the animals. So you have to have a longer focal length lens. Now in this case, I was very lucky because I happened to be at the reenactment of the Battle of Hastings um, in Sussex in England when I saw a falconry display. And after the display, the falconer actually tethered his birds and watered them and fed them. And I was able to get very close, literally within a few feet of this golden eagle. Now getting this shot was obviously a lot easier than going up to Scotland and trying to do the same. But I still had to fill the frame. So what did I do? I used the longest focal length I could so I think I had a 50 to 500 millimeter lens, so I used 500 millimeters, and I got as close as I could. And I also made sure that the background was as far away as possible in order to throw it into um, the bokeh I talked about earlier. So by filling the frame, you obviously focus on the subject. It helps that it's sharp, that it's big, that it fills the frame. We know what we're supposed to be looking at and we're not too worried about the green blur behind. There's not too much of it, it's blurred, we don't care. What we do care about 
in particular is the eye of the bird, but essentially the whole head of the bird. Everything is pin sharp, so we can marvel at the detail of the beak and the feathers and the different parts of the eye. The aspect ratio is simply the ratio of the long edge to the short edge of your picture. Now, most cameras come with an aspect ratio of 3 to 2, and they're designed in such a way that the default aspect ratio is landscape. When we pick up a camera, we're going to take a landscape shot unless we turn it around 90 degrees in order to get a portrait shot. Now, as a result, it's very easy to become lazy. So we end up taking too many landscape shots rather than flipping it round and taking a portrait shot. So I remember Andy Skillen, who's a wildlife photographer, once told me to take more portrait shots of the animals. Um, he, said, he said a rule of thumb should be to take roughly a third of your shots in portrait mode. Now obviously in post-processing you can actually create a square image if you want to and you can create any aspect ratio you like. It doesn't have to be three to two. It could be four to three or you know, five to three or five to four, whatever you like. So what I tend to do is to stick to the basic three to two aspect ratio, but sometimes when I'm cropping the image, I'll decide that I want to flip it around, which is quite easy in Lightroom. When you're cropping it, you can just press X and it'll flip from portrait to landscape or vice versa. I also set up a bespoke panorama aspect ratio, which is three to one. So that means that I can always show um, a very long and thin image, either in landscape, usually, but also sometimes vertically in portrait format. But it depends on the subject. If I want to show a very long horizon, if I want to show that the animal is isolated, I'll make it very small in one corner, and then the rest of the horizon will stretch away in a panorama. But you can play around with it. Just make sure that when you're actually taking the pictures, you're conscious that you take enough in portrait format. Now, when do you decide when to use portrait and when to use landscape? Well, the answer is you just have to look through the viewfinder at what the dominant um, lines are. Are they vertical or are they horizontal? If you take this shot of a pig in India, for instance, in a little village, then you see there are lots of vertical lines in the form of the pillars. So it's natural to flip it around to portrait mode. Equally, when you're out on the savannah in Africa, for example, there's obviously a very dominant horizon. There aren't that many trees, therefore the dominant line is horizontal. Therefore, it's very tempting to use landscape most of the time. But if you're taking pictures of the wildlife, then that's not true anymore. The animal may be coming towards you. So if that's the case, it might be easier to fill the frame by using portrait mode. If it's a cheetah walking directly towards your Jeep, for example, um, you might be able to use portrait mode to follow it all the way. Yes. So. Experiment, but as I say, when you're actually taking the shots, let's try and get it right in camera. So be, be aware of the dominant lines in the image and try to match that to your aspect ratio, either portrait or landscape. Foreground interest is important in landscape photography, but also wildlife photography. So what that generally means is simply finding an object, or in wildlife, most often an animal, to put in the foreground close to the camera, uh, whereas the background will generally be the sky, the clouds, the mountain, the trees, whatever happens to be behind the animal. So in this case, this is a topi at sunset. Now, you might ask yourself, is this a shot of the topi or is it a shot of the sunset? Well, it's both. It has foreground interest, but it also has a beautiful sky with a lovely kind of pinkish purple color in the background. So they're complementary. It doesn't have to be a shot of one or the other. You can have both. And the idea of the foreground interest is it'll give a chance for the eye of the viewer to 
be led from the foreground to the background. There's something in the foreground, but there's also something in the background, so we naturally tend to look at both. And balance of an image is important, as I mentioned before, when talking about negative space. Our eyes just seem to appreciate it for whatever reason. Now, in this case, the balance is created by the subject on the right and the subjects on the left. So we have this jumping Adelie penguin in Antarctica, but we also have three Adelie penguins who look a bit dubious about the whole enterprise on the left. That looks a long way. Not quite sure about that. I think I'll just wait and see how he does. Okay, so balance is important from a visual, from an aesthetic point of view. You can create it in different ways. You can create it using negative space, but you can also create it using uh, duplicate subjects, if you like, one on the right and one on the left. If you have a group of animals, then that's easy. It particularly works if you have a large and a small version. So you might have a lion with her cub, for instance, one on the right, one on the left. Or you might have uh, an animal in the foreground balanced with an animal in the background on the other side of the frame. Whatever you do, however you decide to solve the problem, that kind of balance will give a nice pleasing image. Juxtaposition is just a fancy word for putting two things together that don't obviously belong. So in this image, we have two things that are very different. We have the red ptarmigan in Spitsbergen, and we also have my friend Eric, who's a photographer, just a few feet behind it. So in this case, the juxtaposition is between the man and the animal. The man is also carrying a camera, so it's between the artificial or the man-made or the technological with the natural world. Now there are some links between the two subjects. So the ptarmigan has a red flash above its eye, and obviously Eric is dressed in red. Um, there's also a link between the rock in the foreground, which has orange lichen on it, and Eric's wearing orange gloves. So there is that link between foreground and background, but essentially the power of the image is in that juxtaposition. What is something artificial doing so close to something natural? It just looks, in a way, awkward, different, unusual, and that's what we want. I don't often use black and white in my image. Simplicity in an image is also a great quality. This is a picture of a Chilean flamingo that I took um, in South America at the Iguazu uh, Falls. It was actually in um, an aviary just across the road, but I managed to find a spot where this flamingo was in bright sunshine, but there were a couple of very tall, thick fir trees that were casting a shadow behind it. And therefore I was able to create this simplicity by effectively getting rid of the background. The background is just shadow, it's just black. So we can focus on the image of the bird's head and neck and beak. Now simplicity is important because obviously, again, it focuses on the subject. There's nothing in the background, so there's no point looking at it. Um, it's dark, so it's not bright, it doesn't attract the eye. And there's a kind of artiness about doing this in black and white, because again, we've simplified by removing the colour. So, which subjects benefit from simplicity? Well, it depends, it depends on the environment, but it's worthwhile looking for backgrounds that are quite simple. Yes, It's quite difficult in nature to find black backgrounds, uh, they're usually green because of the grass or the trees, or brown because of the trees, or grey because of the stone or something. But you can engineer a black background through your exposure and through finding those opportunities as I did at Iguazu. Again, talking about background, simplicity is key. In this particular image of a Malachite kingfisher, I was on a boat 
and the background is simply the water. Now I was lucky that the kingfisher was in bright sunshine and the water was a little bit more in shadow. So as we drove over in the boat, I just took lots and lots of pictures as we got closer and closer. And in fact, when I finally put my camera down, the bird was only about three feet away. So it's great to have that opportunity. It's a very small bird. In real life, it's only a few inches tall. But I was able to focus on the bird and cut out the background, distraction if you like, by making sure that the background was darker and fairly homogeneous. So I didn't want any bright highlights in the water. I didn't want anything in the background that was not the water, so a tree or a rock or something. Unfortunately, I managed to do that. What that means is that all our focus is on the bird. We focus on the beautiful colours, um, we focus on the way it's standing, the eye contact, it's looking directly at you, and that creates that kind of energy, that connection with the animal kingdom that we're so often looking for. Humour or cuteness, I think, are a couple of qualities that are perhaps underrepresented in wildlife photography. Animals do crazy things all the time, they do funny things all the time. I once saw a, um, a gorilla, a uh, baby gorilla, only about six months old, grabbing a root uh, to eat in the forest in Miranda. And unfortunately, it was just a bit too bedded in, so it couldn't pull it out very easily. So it pulled and pulled and pulled, and on the third go, it managed to remove the root, but then it pulled so hard that it ended up falling over backwards down the hill. So that was just funny, and I captured that on video. In this case, this was in Antarctica, and I saw the two king penguins coming across this rock. Now, this is a funny picture because we can imagine what the penguins are thinking. Now, they stood over this rock for literally about 10 minutes trying to work out what was going on. I don't know whether they thought it was their egg or thought it was an egg, but it looks a little bit similar maybe. But one of them was, was constantly tapping it and stepping on it and looking down at it, while the other one was just you know, perhaps a little bit bored with all this and thinking, oh yes, come on darling, move along, move along. Anyway, the point is, it's humour, it's cuteness, you know, it's animals doing fun stuff. Yes, you know, we're, we're human, so we have different standards, but we can still appreciate a good joke. So finally, creating a great wildlife photography sometimes depends on knowing when to break the rules. It's a bit like being an abstract painter. You need to know how to paint representative art. You need to be able to make a tree look like a tree on canvas. But once you've mastered that, then you've earned the right to be a cubist or an abstract impressionist or whatever it happens to be. Equally in photography, there are times when the usual rules may not apply. Now you might say, well, that just means there are different rules. In this case, for example, the horizon is very low. Now why is that? Well, there's a good reason. It's because we want to focus on the sky. So the sky is interesting, it's colorful. The foreground, the land, is just black. It's just a silhouette. So that's why I've placed it low in the frame. Now generally, you might say, well, you should probably place the horizon either a third up from the bottom or a third down from the top depending on where the majority of the interest in the frame is. If most of the interest is in the land, then the horizon will be higher. If most of the interest is in the sky, then the horizon will be lower. But on this occasion, as I say, there's a good reason why we need to break the rules. In addition, normally you would probably say that the subject, the blue wildebeest here, should be, if you like, at one of the points of intersection. So probably the bottom left one, using the rule of thirds. But what I wanted to do, again, was to emphasise the scale of the landscape, the size of the sky, and therefore the isolation of the animal. So by putting it in one corner, I've tried to do that. So there are always occasions when you can break the rules. And maybe that's the difference between good and great. It's all very well going by the rule book but there's a temptation to do things the same way every time. Whereas what we really want to do is to produce something that's different, something that's never been done before. 
Now, originality is very important, and part of the way in which you can create an original image is by breaking the rules. You just need to know when to do it. That's it. Thank you very much indeed, and I hope all those rules of composition are useful to you.